Welcome back to Close Up. Andrew Yang is unlike any other candidate running for president. His big proposal is universal basic income, what he calls a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month to every American 18 years of age and older. His goal is to infuse money directly into communities like this one, Monticello, Iowa, where the downtown has seen better days. People are responding to the policy, but they're also responding to the man himself. We caught up with the entrepreneur turned candidate on his campaign bus as he barnstorms the state. Andrew Yang, thanks for joining us on the trail here in Iowa. We appreciate your time. Adam, thank you for joining us on the trail in Iowa. Yeah. We're here on the Yang bus. Uh, it's a thrill to have you here because you know, uh, I, I always see you when I'm in New Hampshire, but never when I'm here in Iowa. It's a little bit of a cognitive dissonance for folks out there, but uh, you're going to be on the debate stage in New Hampshire. This is very big. Do you feel pressure to do something big? You know, you've, uh, for, frankly, like you haven't gotten the minutes uh, up there that you should have uh, in a lot of these debates. Do you feel like you're going to have to throw some elbows to, to get time and really say something on this debate stage? Uh, I feel great on so many levels about being on the debate stage again in New Hampshire, uh, but part of it is that the stage will be much, much smaller than during most any other debate. Uh, there'll be, I believe, seven of us, and there might even be fewer than that if uh, someone drops out between now and then. So I'm going to have tons of air time to make my case to the people in New Hampshire and around the country. And I also feel more free because, uh, frankly, um, missing that last debate made me feel like, uh, you know, like I can come back and, and be fairly uh, confident and comfortable and human and not really worry about anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you parlay the, you know, Iowa's different, right? They've got the caucus here, viability. Um, if you don't reach viability here in Iowa, how do you slingshot into New Hampshire? So you're going to go from that to being on the debate stage. So how do you navigate this kind of unique situation potentially? Well, we're, we're excited about getting back to New Hampshire. Uh, I gotta say, uh, I feel like New Hampshire has been the most welcome place for the campaign since day one. Uh, and I think we're gonna show out on February 11th. Certainly, I think we're gonna have a ton of momentum coming from Iowa, but I also think New Hampshire voters are very independent-minded and that they'll make their own determination. You had an emotional moment on the campaign trail yesterday, kind of looking at you know, considering it seemed like you kind of took this look at the journey you've been on. I love Iowa. Uh, uh, campaigning here the last two years has been the journey of my life. Uh, I'm really glad that you all are going to determine the future of our country. You know, describe what hit you there. Well, part of it was that my family's been on the road with me in New Hampshire and in Iowa. I didn't see my boys as much as I'd hoped to um, while they were here in the state. Uh, but I was reflecting on the fact that I've been campaigning for the better part of two years and that that period was coming to an end. And I thought about everything that this campaign has meant to me and my family, uh, how kind people have been to us in Iowa and New Hampshire. Uh, and all that we've been through, all that I've learned, all the people I've talked to. Uh, and it just was a, a real emotional moment because uh, and it is a very human process. I mean, you're literally talking to thousands of Americans about their struggles, their hopes for the future, how we can do better for our kids. Yeah. And, you know, we've talked to you a lot about, uh, you know, growing up, uh, going to high school in New Hampshire, essentially, feeling like you, you know, sometimes alienated. It's got to be remarkable, uh, you know, to look back on, you know, Andrew Yang, uh, where you've come from, and, and now you've got this kind of groundswell behind you on a nationwide level. Yeah, it is fun. I mean, I joke all the time that I was the last kid someone thought was going to run for president on so many levels. Uh, but many, many of us see that we need to build a better future for the next generation, that we're leaving them a, a mess on so many levels. We're leaving them an economy that's not going to work for them. Record high levels of stress, anxiety, depression, uh, even suicide and drug overdoses on top of 
this cost of college that's uh, higher than ever, climate change. I mean, we just have very, very big challenges that we need to make progress on really, really quickly. I, kn I knew other Americans felt the same way. You mentioned the drug overdoses. Obviously, the opioid crisis is a huge issue in New Hampshire. What are you going to do, if you're the president, to stop this pipeline of drugs that comes up uh, from Mexico and other countries uh, directly into New Hampshire? We have to do everything we can to get our arms around the opiate epidemic. To me, I'm most focused on trying to help people get off uh, the drugs and, and become clean. I know that's a very, very big challenge because these drugs are incredibly addictive. Uh, so I propose that we have uh, that we stop prosecuting use of opiates if it's a personal use. You're not selling, you're not dealing, you're not profiting, but you're addicted. We need to get you straight to counseling and treatment uh, and not send you to a prison cell. And then we also need to work on trying to curb the supply. But I'm more focused on getting people the treatment and resources they need because this is an epidemic that was spawned by capitalism run amok. We let these drug companies uh, start infecting our people by saying these drugs weren't addictive and now here we are. So we have to put those resources back into our communities and say, look, here's a path forward. Resource-wise, um, you're a math guy. I'm sure you know the stats. Uh, treatment, the long-term success rate is at less than 10%. It could be a lot of money. I mean, it, certainly you say humanity first, but we're talking about a huge investment if it's going to be getting people rehabbed and keeping them away from those drugs. Well, when you look at the money, Adam, Purdue Pharma made $30 billion uh, distributing these drugs that have killed so many of our family members and community members. I say we take every dime of that money back and put it towards making our people stronger and healthier. Let's shift back to the political here. What do you make of Mike Bloomberg skipping the early states, essentially? What's the message that sends, do you think? Uh, I think Mike's made a, a couple of decisions that I completely disagree with. Like, I, I think if you're going to run for president, you need to spend time with the people in New Hampshire. You need to spend time with the people here in Iowa. Uh, and you should be taking donations from Americans so that they can feel like they have some buy into your campaign instead of saying, hey, I won't take any donations. Uh, you know, that, that, that sends actually the wrong message. It's not like, you know, we want you to actually be a part of a movement when you actually donate five, ten, twenty dollars to my campaign or any candidate's campaign. So uh, I think that uh, Mike has made a couple of decisions that I disagree with. Uh, to fund your ambitious agenda, you talk a lot about the UBI, but you're going to use a value-added tax uh, to get there. Uh, that's generally been a tough sell in the United States. How do you convince Congress to go along with a VAT? Well, the value-added tax has been on the table for years, and every other developed country has one except for us. And so what I say to people on both sides of the aisle is, do you think it's appropriate for Amazon, a trillion-dollar tech company, to pay zero in taxes, less than uh, you or your family? And no one thinks that's appropriate. And the best mechanism to change that is a value-added tax. It would generate hundreds of billions in new revenue that if we put it directly into consumers' hands, build a trickle-up economy, then we can create an improved way of life for people in New Hampshire, in parts of the state or the country that are rural and getting depleted progressively. This is the game changer we've been waiting for. On the coronavirus, uh, travel restrictions are being instituted. Uh, you said if you were the president, you'd be working closely with the CDC. Uh, if these things get more serious, how, as a leader, would you balance you know, the freedoms that Americans enjoy with the need to sort of lock down on these things? You see what China's doing, you know, restricting travel, you know, the things that they can do there. How would that work in the United States if such a situation arose here? Well, I think that most Americans agree that we'd prefer our government to take a bit of a heavier hand if it meant that we were going to be safe from the spread of an infectious virus that might endanger our lives and the lives of our loved ones. Uh, and so uh, it is a balance at all times, but to me, the balance would be to safeguard public safety. Uh, and as a citizen, if the government was trying to follow up with me to make sure that uh, you know I wasn't infected or my family wasn't infected, I actually would feel a degree of reassurance and comfort, and not like, oh, you know, leave me alone. Hmm. On student loan forgiveness, uh, you've said that uh, you don't exactly think that should go wipe the slate entirely clean. Uh, why not go that far, and, and what would you do instead? Well, I proposed a 10 by 10 plan where. Uh, if you commit 10% of your salary for 10 years, then you emerge debt-free in a decade. Uh, I think it's impossible just to wipe everyone's debt clean um, all at once because people have very different situations. People have made very different, um, uh, different investments uh, in their education and that 
trying to treat it all as one giant block uh, is probably not the best approach, but we do need to do more for people who are balancing these student loans that in some cases they'll never get out from under. Right. And as we wrap up here, what should Granite Staters and even the Hawkeye State expect out of Energy A? Well, I think you can expect us to continue to outperform expectations. We're going to grow and grow and peak right when the voting starts. I can't wait to be back on the debate stage next week in New Hampshire, and I can't wait for the voting to start in New Hampshire on February 11th. All right, Andrew Yang, thanks for joining us here on the trail. So Andrew Yang is clearly very eager to get on that debate stage in front of both Granite State voters and a nationwide audience.